Right, okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the last lecture of uh, Who Do You Think You Are 2015. Uh, my name is Morris Thiessen. I am a doctor, a pharmaceutical physician, and an avid genealogist and genetic genealogist. Uh, I started taking my tests uh, in 2008, and I've been testing left, right, and center ever since. So um, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about solving adoption mysteries in your family tree. And it doesn't have to just relate to adoption, it can relate to illegitimacies, and not just at a, at a near level, but going back in time as well. So if you have a parent who was adopted, if you have a grandparent who was adopted or illegitimate, then this type of a presentation will be very, very informative for you. Now, just to talk about the power of DNA, uh, a couple of years ago, I actually received um, an email from the son of Pauline May Cartwright. Now, they've asked me at some of my talks to actually mention the name, so if anybody knows Pauline May Cartwright, please get in touch with me because I need to get in touch with her. And her son wrote to me and said, unlike most people who are doing their tree out of interest, we have a specific purpose, which is to find out who my mother's birth parents are. Now, through DNA testing, only this year we received a letter my grandmother had written in 1962, which a relative in Australia had kept all these years. She also sent photographs of my mother's mother. So at the age of 84, she finally got to see what her mother looked like. You never know what you will find. What's it like at the age of 84 to see your mother for the first time? It has to be an incredible experience. And the thing is that DNA is now allowing this type of discovery to become possible. Here is a picture of um, Pauline May Cartwright. Her, um, her mother, rather, this is her mother, Phyllis Ina Cartwright, born in 1904, uh, died in London in 1970. And uh, as they said at the end of the email, you never know what you will find. And that's very, very true, because uh, DNA testing does come with a government health warning. You know, the person that matched this person had no idea that the, uh, this, this distant cousin existed. You could find half-siblings that you never knew existed. Uh, you could find that um, you, in fact, were a secret adoption yourself. Or the experience of one Canadian chap was um, he found out that he was switched at birth. And he was, uh, he ended up with a Jewish family, thinking he was Jewish, when in fact he was Irish. And they actually traced the other baby, who was Jewish, and had ended up with the Irish family. So, uh, and that was recently uh, blogged about on um, uh, the internet. The attitude was, well, we can laugh about it now, but at the time it took a little bit of getting used to. So, what we'll cover today is what to do before you begin to start looking for those birth family members, uh, which DNA tests to take and why. We're going to look at how to help a mother find her adopted child, and we're going to look at how to find biological parents or other family of an adoptee, whether that adoptee is yourself, your father, your mother, your grandparents. So before you begin, one of the most important things is to lay the groundwork and be very, very um, certain about what questions you want to ask. And three of the most important questions facing adoptees, um, or even biological parents looking for their adopted children, or how do I identify them? How do I find them? How do I approach them if I do find them? Or how do I approach their adopted families if I find them? And how do I protect everyone from getting hurt? Because this can be a very, very emotional experience for a lot of people. So by planning well in advance, you can actually avoid a lot of these problems further down the line. Often, people will, uh, who are adopted will pursue their identification stage anonymously. They'll do their own little documentary research, and, and they can do that perfectly anonymously. But with DNA, it's a different kind of thing. Um, using the traditional pro process, they will gather the information first, identify their birth parents, perhaps, or their adopted child, and then decide what do they want to do with that information. Do they want to make contact, or is it just enough to know where they came from? So these are the kind of questions that you have to ask at the beginning of your search. With DNA, anonymity is more problematic. If you match someone on DNA, they will see that you match them, so the cat will be out of the bag very, very quickly. And they will see that the, the likely relationship that they have to you 
Oh, I didn't know that I had an ant because we share 25% of our DNA. Actually, that's not an ant, that's a half-sister. That's the same amount of DNA a half-sister would share. So consider using a disguised name or maybe um, an email address that is disguised and doesn't contain your own name if you want to retain that degree of anonymity when you're doing your search. Also, just like the Girl Scouts, be prepared. Um, that means having your letters written because when you do find these people, what are you going to say to your birth mother? What are you going to say to your birth father um, and to their subsequent children, your half-siblings, um, and to their children, their, the grandchildren of your, of your birth parents? Also, um, if you're a birth mother, what are you going to say to your adopted child? Presumably they're going to have lots of questions. Try and anticipate what those questions are going to be and uh, be prepared. Secondly, and it means doing all this within the context of an adequate support network. So I would never recommend anybody take this emotional journey on their own. Have your friends around you, have your family around you, have the support of a professional who actually deals with putting adoptees back in touch with their birth families. Uh, it's a much more proactive approach than you might have uh, previously thought, but um, it's something that you would have to do anyway in due course, so it helps to actually Go through this process at the beginning of your search, and then you can always refine it in time. So which DNA tests should we take in order to try and find out who are the birth family or the parents of an illegitimate child? Uh, mainly autosomal DNA and Y DNA. Mitochondrial DNA plays a much lesser role. And just to remind you about the DNA test, uh, it's a simple swab or a saliva sample. It ends up in a test tube. It goes to the lab. In the lab, they look at the, uh, the uh, sample you've taken, they put it through the machine, and it comes out with your results on your own personalized website, personalized web page, which has your username and password. Not only that, but they compare your results with the results of everybody else in the entire database. And you come up with a list of matches. And not only that, but those matches are loaded up to your web page, and you can also get involved in a variety of different projects. So there are a variety of surname projects out there run by project administrators. If you find that a particular surname is coming up a lot of the time in your matches, join the surname project. Contact the administrator. Tell them, I see the name Gordon is coming up a lot in my matches. You are the administrator of the Gordon project. Do you have any clues or advice that you can give me to help explore this a little bit further? Now, inside the test tube that's sent to the lab, you have these cells that have been dislodged when you've been scraping your cheeks and inside the cells you have these little blue things called mitochondria. These would contain mitochondrial DNA but you only get these from your mother. So the mitochondrial DNA is a very good way of tracing your mother's 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 line. It's going to pass along that line down to you. Inside the nucleus of the cell you have 46 chromosomes arranged into 23 pairs. Each copy each pair has, one, has two copies. One copy of the pair you get from your father, the other copy of the pair you get from your mother. So you've got two chromosome 21s, one is paternal, one is ma uh, maternal. The last pair down here, um, which is chromosome pair number 23, are called the sex chromosomes, and they're, they're either uh, two X chromosomes, an X and an X, or an X and a Y. If you're an X and an X, you're a woman. If you're an X and a Y, you're a man. And the four main types of DNA would be the X, the Y, the mitochondrial, and then everything apart from the sex chromosomes is called the autosomal DNA. So that's where we get those terms from. Now, the three main types of DNA test are the Y DNA test, which goes up along the father's 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 line, the mitochondrial DNA test, which goes up along the mother's 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 line, and then the autosomal DNA test, which covers all of the ancestral lines in the middle. Both the Y and the mitochondrial only go up along one ancestral line. Father, 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 or mother, 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 mother. The autosomal is all the other ancestral lines in between. So there's much greater coverage of the ancestral lines with the autosomal DNA. The Y DNA can be very useful for identifying the surname of the birth father. And I'm going to give you some information on that in a while. But let's first of all look at the database size. And here you see that these are the three commercial companies. Ancestry DNA has, has a database size of about 800,000, which is autosomal DNA primarily. 
23 and me 900,000 autosomal DNA primarily, family tree DNA 700,000 with 150,000 being autosomal DNA. The important thing from a British and Irish perspective is that the company with the largest British and Irish database is Family Tree DNA. 30% of their database is not US, compared to maybe about 10% with 23andMe and only 1% with Ancestry because they only launched it a couple of months ago. So if you have um, an adoption or illegitimacy based in Britain, our Ireland, then it's likely that Family Tree DNA will give you the best results for that. But we encourage all adoptees to test in each of these three major databases. Now, the first thing we're going to look at is how to help a mother find her adopted child. And some of you will be very familiar with um, this lady here, Philomena Lee, and they made the movie Philomena about her, starring uh, Stephen... Um, what's his name? This chap here, what's his name again? What, what? To Steve Coogan, yes. Mm, thank you, turn around. That was very, very wise advice. Um, brilliant movie, very, very well done, and Judy Dench was fantastic. It's based on this true story of this woman who went looking for her son and hit brick walls, hurdles. You know, she spent decades looking for her son, and then finally she finds her son, and of course he has passed away. Um, you probably have seen the movie, so I hope I'm not spoiling it for too many people. Go and see it anyway, because it is a beautiful, beautiful movie. But a lot of uh, women like Philomena, especially in Ireland back in the 1950s and 60s, when they became pregnant and they were single mothers, a lot of them were forced to give up their children. Now they signed legal papers and all the rest of it, but a lot of them felt that they were treated very badly, and then there's a wall of silence preventing the mothers in later years from trying to contact their children and also stopping the children from trying to contact their mothers. Um, so here is how DNA can actually help. It can actually break through those brick walls and those hurdles in a matter of weeks, if you're very, very lucky. So if you're a birth mother looking for your child, you would send a DNA sample to all three of the major testing companies, and you would test for an autosomal DNA test primarily. The results would get back in about four to 10 weeks, and if you're very lucky, and I'm gonna show you an example, you would find your child already in the database waiting for you to find them and they would share 50% of their DNA with you. And that's approximately 3,383 centimorgans. If, for example, your child had had a child, then you would find your grandchild in the database 25% match. And if there was other relatives there, you might find first cousins, second cousins, third cousins. Any close cousins can be really, really useful in trying to identify where, uh, who the, where the child is. Um, but that's why it's important, because it might be an instant find. As soon as those results come back, it just stares at you in, in the face, bursts out of the computer screen, you have a match, and you have found your child. Have your letters ready, be prepared, and have your support network, because you will be overcome with an emotional roller coaster. This is what the Family Finder results looked like on Family Tree DNA. Here's me here. It gives you um, an estimated relationship range. Um, this one here, I put down as a parent-child. You could, have a, a, could estimate it as grandparent. It could be a first to second cousin, a second to fourth cousin. Um, they also, by clicking on the name, you've got the email address of that particular contact. So contact with that person is instantaneous virtually. You can send them an email. It also has things like the most distant ancestors. Um, you also click on the icon, and you can send them an email directly. So be prepared, have your letters written. What do you want to say to your child? What do you want to say to your grandchild? What do you want to say to the adoptive parents and any of their natural children who will be the half-siblings of your, of your adopted child? And how do you go best about going about it? These are really, really difficult questions to answer, so it's so important to have people that you can talk to and professional people that you can talk to as well. So have your support network alerted. There will be many emotions, strong and mixed. Everyone will need time to process them and resist being impulsive. If you want to do something right here, right now, the best thing is to sleep on it and think about doing it tomorrow morning instead. What if your child is not there? Okay, 
Your DNA can remain in the database if you want as a legacy. Um, if your child or any of his or her children or ever do a DNA test, you will come up as one of their close matches, whether that's in five years' time or 50 years' time. So it's very important to fill out the beneficiary information on Family Tree DNA. Leave your DNA as a legacy to future generations. At least it tells them a very, very important message. I tried to find you. You could also link a, uh, uh, write up your story and leave a link to it on a website or a blog as a way of kind of telling people, I did try to find you and here's the story in case you ever do find me, even though I might not be here. And this is the beneficiary information tab in Family Tree D DNA. And you just leave your name, I've made this up, and a telephone number and an um, email address so that you can pass on administration of the account in the event of your demise. Second thing I'd like to talk about is how to find the biological parents or biological family of an adoptee. And that adoptee could be you, it could be your parents, it could be your grandparents. The first thing we're going to look at is finding the birth um, father. But the important thing to note here is that a lot of adoptions before, certainly in Ireland, before the 1952 Adoption Act were just done informally. And even after the Act, a lot of the adoptions were done informally. And the problem with uh, informal adoptions is that there is no adoption documentation. There is no non-identifying information, so you have no clues whatsoever. And in this situation, DNA may be the only hope that you have to try and find that particular person. So let's talk about how to use Y-DNA to find the birth father. Now, Y-DNA, as you remember, is passed along the father, father, father line, and it can be very useful for identifying the birth surname, of the, the surname of the birth father. And um, here are some Y-DNA statistics that I looked at from a sample of people who tested in London last year. Now, some people, when they do a Y-DNA 37 test, they have more than a thousand matches at 12 markers. And that's about 29% of that particular sample of 110 people. 20, at 25 markers, three out of 57 people still had more than a thousand matches. And that's about 5% of the sample. So for some people, they've got a relatively common genetic signature that matches tons and tons of people. On the other extreme, about 23% of people out of the 65 who tested to 37 markers had no matches whatsoever. So that's almost a quarter of people who do a Y-DNA 37 test will have no matches at that level whatsoever. About 50% will have somewhere between 1 and 10 matches, and about 25% again will have above 10 matches, 14%, uh, 11 to 20, uh, 5%, 21 to 30, and 8% of people had more than 30 matches at 37 markers. One of them at 34 matches at 37 markers, one of them at 35, 37, one at 66, and one person had 125 matches at 37 markers. So it's important to know that when you do a Y-DNA test, it's actually going to give you a very, very large spread of matches. If you're unlucky, you won't match anybody. If you are uh, very lucky, you'll match too many people. And if you match too many people, or match nobody at all, that would actually be an indication for upgrading your results to a higher level of markers like 67 or 111. Now the other interesting thing is, from this sample in London, was I calculated, uh, and this is very much an in inverted commas, an NPE rate. The NPE rate is a non-paternity event rate, also known as the not the parent expected rate. And this is the number of people where it seems as if they have a, an adoption or an illegitimacy in their direct male line. And the way that I uh, tried to find that out was, I looked at the surname of the person and I compared it with the surname of their most distant known ancestor that they had provided. And very interestingly, eight out of the 55 people who had provided a, a most distant known ancestor surname did not match that most distant known ancestor. And that was 15% of that particular sample. Now, it's a very, very crude um, analysis, but it, it suggests things like perhaps 
why DNA testing is actually getting very popular among people who have an adoption or an illegitimacy on their direct mail line, and you get more of these people testing. Or it could be that those people who have a mismatch with their most distant known ancestor are actually writing that down more commonly than people who don't. So it's, it's, uh, but it's an interesting finding that is worthy of further research. Most importantly, from the point of view of adoptees, people uh, who had an exact or a variant surname of their own among their matches was about 10 out of 65. So about 15% of this sample of 65 men had their surname in their matches. Their matches had their, their exact surname or a variant of their surname in their matches. And what this means is, if you are a male adoptee and you do the Y-DNA test, you have roughly a 15% chance of finding the birth, the, the surname of your birth father within your matches. Now, you might be lucky to have three matches, and two of those three matches have that particular exact surname or a variant thereof. Two out of four, one out of three, one out of three, 10 out of 35, still a third, so there will be a predominant surname in that particular uh, group of matches. Three out of 13, one out of eight, three out of 27, which is like one ninth, one out of 16, and then two out of 125. So you can see that um, as in these 10 examples, you can get a very clear signal, uh, or at the further extreme, two out of 125 have the actual uh, exact surname. Um, only about 10% would probably give you a, a clear signal. So I'd say you have a very good chance in about 10% of cases of actually having that birth father's surname among the surnames of your matches. And that's a very good clue. There was a chap last year in Dublin who uh, talked about uh, finding his, doing his Y-DNA test, and he had five matches at 37 markers, and they were Hamilton, 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 Smith, Jones. So Hamilton was standing out as a predominant surname in his list. He combined that name Hamilton with the non-identifying information he had relating to his mother, and he found her obituary in the newspapers. So within the space of a couple of minutes, he actually had found the obituary of his mother, who her father was, who her husband was, and all of his half-siblings. And then he was able to get in touch with you, and he's with, with them, and he's reunited with them. So it can be a very, very powerful uh, method. And here's an example. Let's say this fictitious character, Finbar O'Brien, does a Y-DNA 37 test, and at 12 markers, he has eight matches. And they are Massey, Massey, Simmons, Massey, Simmons, Massey, Simmons, Massey. Well, now this is a true example, but it's not Finbar O'Brien. Um, this is a true example. Even at 12 markers, there are two predominant surnames emerging from this set of matches. Let's go up to the next uh, level. Let's go up to 25 markers and see what happens to the surnames. Okay, at 25 markers, seven matches. Massey, Massey, Simmons, 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 Massey, and no. But still, Simmons and Massey are the predominant surnames at 25. At 37 markers, we have Massey, Simmons, and Simmons. Okay, so there still are two predominant surnames at 37 markers. The most likely candidate for the birth father of this particular individual here would be a man named Simmons or Massey. And I know for a fact it was Massey, because this uh, is a, a real case where um, a chap whose father was illegitimate but there was a rumor that his father was called Massey, did the DNA test, and it was a beautiful way of confirming the family lore that had passed down through the generations. And they were able to confirm what had been said in the family for many, many years, that his grandfather was a Massey. They have since joined the Massey Surname Society, and they've gone to a variety of different family reunions. So it's a, a very, very positive uh, step forward. Here's another example. This person is called Tim Cruz, for lack of a better name. And um, at 37 markers, he's got seven matches. McLaughlin, McMahon, Gleason, Neville, Sykes, Hart, and Markham. So they're all completely different surnames. And it, you know, maybe one of those is the surname of the birth father, but it's impossible to indicate any pattern in that particular result. Let's upgrade to 67 markers and see what happens. 
okay, now there's only three matches, Gleason, Gleason, and McLaughlin. So in this particular case, I would be suspecting one of my ancestors as being responsible for the, the being the birth father in this particular case. And this would indicate that the most likely candidate for the birth father would be a man named Gleason. Now, of course, it doesn't tell you for sure that it is a man named Gleason, but what it does, and this is what DNA always does, is it points you in the direction of further research. It gives you a clue and says, run with this. You might get somewhere. So that's why DNA. Now let's look at autosomal DNA and how we can use it to find the birth mother and also the birth father. But I think autosomal, people want to find the birth mother primarily and then after that maybe go on to the birth father. But it's useful for both. So take an adoptee, for example. They should give a DNA sample to all three major testing companies and the results will be available in four to 10 weeks. If their parent is in the database, they will be an exact 50% match with their parent because they will have got half of their DNA from that particular individual. So 50% of their DNA will match that parent's DNA. If they have a half sibling in the database, it will be a 25% match. And if they have other relatives like a half nephew, 12.5%, first cousin, 12.5%, second cousin, 3%, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. Uh, those are the kind of uh, percentages of DNA that they will share with them. Have your letters prepared, have your support network alerted. Similarly, if you have an adopted parent, your parent was adopted, and they sent in the sample to all three testing companies, four to six, four to 10 weeks later, the results come in. If you have encouraged your mother to test, her grand your grandparent, her mother or father, might very well be in the database, and they will match you 25%. So if you've done the test as a proxy for your mother, you will match her parent, your grandparent, at 25%. If you have a half-aunt or a half-uncle, 12.5%, and then a variety of other different relatives, a variety of other different percentages that you share with them. Have your letters ready, have your support network alerted. The further you are away from the relative, the less likely it is going to be a complete shock and there's going to be an emotional response. But the closer and closer you get to finding a birth mother or a half-sibling, that's when the emotions really begin to kick in. Here again is an example, and uh, you click on the, the, the name of the matches and you get a profile of your matches. You click on the email icon over there and you can uh, email them directly. Um, most of your matches are not going to be your parent or your grandparent. They're mostly going to be more distant, such as a first to second cousin, or uh, uh, even further than that, second, fourth, and fifth. And most people are going to have fifth cousins, fourth cousins, distant cousins in their, de in their um, list of matches. But here's an example of uh, Jenny, 75 years old. She um, contacted me just uh, after Christmas in January, and she said she was uh, adopted raised with nine kids, but she always felt different because she was adopted. And she'd been searching for her birth family for the last 35 years. She waited until her adopted mother had passed away until she started her search. And you find that with a lot of adoptees, out of respect for their adoptive parents, they wait until they've passed on before they start looking for their own birth family so as not to upset people. Um, her non-identifying information was incorrect and it had sent her down uh, dead ends and trace, chasing after red herrings for 35 years of searching. Then she tested with Family Tree DNA back in 2010, and just like most of us, she had lots of matches, no particular luck trying to connect. So when she contacted me, she said, I, I don't know where, what to do next, what should I do? So I said to her, well, you should test with all of the companies, make sure that you're fishing in all three pools rather than just the one. And then I said, I'm off to the Caribbean on holidays. I'll contact you when I get back and see how you get on. So about four weeks later then, I got um, an email from her. And she said, I tested with the other two like you told me to. And I found a first cousin in one of the databases. What do I do now? And uh, she said, um, I, I've got in touch with him. His name is David. And we've been having grand chat on the phone. We're not sure how we're related. And also, um, the other big thing about this is that uh, if he's a first cousin match, we don't know whether it's on Jenny's mother's side of the family or Jenny's father's side of the family. 
So it could either be via her birth father or her birth mother. The other, so that's the, the first question. We don't know from the data whether it's maternal or paternal. The other thing she said was, David just told me he's 35. I'm 75, so how can we be first cousins? She, think I th she says, I think it's more likely that we're probably first cousins once removed. And that was probably a very reasonable thing to say because a lot of the time, the actual connection is further back than we think. Uh, but still, again, we're not sure whether it's maternal or paternal side. So this would be David down here, a generational level lower than Jenny. So she said, would you look at my results? And I said, sure. So she sent her results over. And what I'm expecting for a first cousin once removed is a total percentage of DNA shared of about 6.25%, with a range of about 3.3 to 8.5%. And you can get these... Uh, uh, statistics at these two links below. This is going on YouTube, so it's, you, you'll catch it on YouTube if need be. And in terms of centimorgans, that's 248 to 638. That's the range I'm looking for, for this supposed first cousin once removed. He had 9.77% shared. Now that is outside the range, way above the estimate, and outside the range that you'd expect for first cousins once removed. And also, he had 727 centimorgans. Again, it's way outside the range that has previously been observed using a huge database for first cousins once removed. So I was in the position where I said, this is not your first cousin once removed. It has to be closer. Because it's actually closer to what you'd expect of first cousins, which is 12.5% with a range of 7.3 to 13.8. So I went back to Jenny and I said, I don't think we have found your first cousin once removed. I think we've found your half-nephew, and his mother or his father is your half-sibling. So the next thing to do was to look more closely at the data to see if we had any clues. And the first clue was that David was an X match to Jenny. On the X chromosome, they shared a segment that was 26 centimeters long, centimorgans long. Now, David is a male, so he's going to have an X and a Y chromosome. The Y chromosome he will have got from his father, the X chromosome he can only have got from his mother. So we're looking at uh, a mother here. It's via David's mother that the connection is. The next clue that we had, we still don't know whether it's maternal or paternal, it could be on the father's side of the family, Jenny's father's side, or Jenny's mother's side. But we next looked at the mitochondrial DNA. And Jenny's mitochondrial DNA haplogroup was H11A2. David's was H11A2. Now, mitochondrial DNA passes along the mother's 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 line. So a feasible explanation would be that Jenny got it from her mother, her mother also passed it on to David's mother, and David's mother passed it on to David. Very, very plausible explanation, but it's just one story. Because, of course, other people in the general population are going to have H11A2 as well. So another alternative explanation would be that it could have passed down on this side from mother to son, but this particular mother would have got it maybe from her father, not, not from her father, but from... Uh, from the mother of whoever this person's sexual partner was after this, he had had uh, relations with this woman up here. So it could have come down an alternative line. The way to kind of uh, estimate the probability of that happening is to look for the incidence and prevalence of H11A2 in the general population. And the great thing was that um, among Jenny's matches, she had 925 matches, all of whom had done the mitochondrial DNA test. Only six out of 925 were actually H11A2. That's 0.65% of the population, or put another way, one in 154. So the chances of this story being true is about one in 154, leaving the chances of this story being true around 99.3%. So when Winnie got this analysis, she wrote to me and she said, I am on pins and needles. David has asked his mother to do the test and to see if we're a match. 
Uh, I'm on pins and needles waiting for the, her results. There have been so many disappointments and dead ends in my 35 years of searching. I'm afraid to be hopeful that his mum is truly my half sister. The last few days have been uh, such an emotional roller coaster. I think that I've run out of tears of joy. Well, it was a long six weeks waiting for the results, but they finally came through and it was a 25% match, which is exactly what you'd expect for half-sister. So, then um, uh, Jenny writes to me and says, the last few days have been overwhelmingly wonderful. I've had long conversations with my newly found half-siblings because she had four half-siblings altogether, as well as her half-nephew. Um, and we've exchanged more photographs. They say that the resemblance between our shared mother and me is striking. It's just amazing how this family, who a month ago had no idea that I existed, has embraced me with such love and grace, despite having to absorb the shocking news about how we are related. I am so very, very lucky. So that was a wonderful denouement to this story. And the thing is that David, his half-nephew, he'd, he'd done the test two years ago. He was just sitting there in the database waiting to be discovered. And it's just because she hadn't tested with all three companies that he wasn't. So be comprehensive, test with all three, um, and this could be the outcome that you, that you get. It doesn't happen very often, and she was very, very lucky in this situation because she found somebody so close in the database that matches her. But as more and more people test, these kind of stories are going to become much more commonplace. The other thing to note is that her family embraced her wholeheartedly that doesn't always happen either. So even though this is a wonderful outcome, don't rush into it think that this is going to be what's happening to you. That's why you have to be prepared, have your letters written, and be very cautious in your approach. What is going to happen as you do these testings is there will be moments of extreme excitement and joy, and then nothing for six weeks while you're waiting for the results to come through. So that is an example of Jenny. Um, when you are using the autosomal DNA, usually you don't get uh, relatives that close, and you have to um, take a step-by-step -step approach to analyzing your, your, your matches to see where the connection might be. And I talked about this uh, yesterday. It's available on YouTube, so do check this out if need be, because there's a lot more detail in this. Uh, and you can find the, uh, the videos by just Googling YouTube, who do you think you are, DNA Lectures 2015, and you'll find it. So the stepwise approach involves where does the common ancestor sit, is the common ancestor obvious, how to eliminate non-contenders, and working with small triangulated groups of people who are probably related by the same common ancestor. Um, here's an example of working with close matches, and this is a little bit further back, say second cousins, first to second cousins. But it again illustrates the kind of process that you have to go through, and this is a fictional example. Say, for example, we have Sam down here, who was uh, born about 1960, and one of his matches is a woman um, called Liz, and she was born about 1960 as well. So the initial contact would be, oh, I see we're matches, uh, let's share information. And uh, the match is a first to second cousin. Well, if it's a first to second cousin, then we're going to be looking at um, maybe common set of grandparents, if it's a first cousin, a common set of great-grandparents if it's a second cousin. Hopefully Liz has worked out her tree quite far back, and in this situation she has. She's got a few brick walls around about 1835, but she's gone actually back as far as the assumed connection, which is great. Sam, on the other hand, he's got blanks in every single one of his ancestors. So, common ancestor is a grandparent, and you've got four of those, or great-grandparents, you've got eight of those people to choose from. And presumably, if this is adoption cases, only one of them, they're not going to be married to each other, and only one of them is going to be the parent. Um, have any of your cousins tested, Sam asks Liz, and do they match me? And Liz says, well, actually, yes, one of my cousins has tested. Let me check her results. And uh, they look at um, Liz's cousin, but there's no match there. Sam and this cousin do not match, and because... Um, that particular cousin does not match Sam, it means the connection with Liz cannot be on that side of the family. Because we're looking at a relatively close connection here. So if we were expecting a match similar to Liz, it should show up in the results. The fact that Liz's 
And what is it? That's her father, her grandparents. This is Liz's first cousin. Doesn't match Sam, therefore we can get rid of all of that side of the family. Rule out the non-contenders for the common ancestor. So already we're, we've got off to a great start because we've already got rid of the 50% of candidates in Liz's family tree. The next step is Sam asks her, can we ask cousins on the other side to test? Now, that could be a problem because there might be cousins to Liz, but you might inadvertently stumble on half-siblings to Sam. So Liz is very iffy about this because she says, yes, I do have first cousins on the other side of the family, but how do we know that these aren't your half-siblings and one of these people here isn't your father or your mother? So there's a lot of humming and hawing about are we certain about the DNA? You know, this does happen. Are you absolutely sure that you've interpreted it correctly? Is there not some other explanation that could explain what we're finding? But in the end, where are we now? Yes, Betty does agree to do the test, and she turns out to be a second cousin. So the relationship would be um, around about the um, second cousin would be first. Uh, that's the first cousin. Second cousins would be up at this level. So we're looking at these people up here. And the common ancestor is one of these, possibly one of these four people. This is where the DNA is pointing at this point in time. As we get further information, we'll either refine our hypothesis or change it to a different hypothesis. The next thing to look at is the X chromosome. Can we use the X chromosome to get a clue and maybe narrow down these four candidates to two candidates or even just one candidate? Well. Liz got her ex from her mother and her father. Now, we know that her father's side of the family has been ruled out, so we can forget about that. Her mother got her X chromosome from her mother and her father. Her father got his X chromosome from his mother, and these X chromosomes, her, this mother, this uh, woman here, got her X chromosomes from her father and her mother. Now, Sam and Liz do match on the X chromosome, it's a substantial max, match, but and by looking at the X chromosome, we've been able to narrow down the candidates from four possible candidates to three possible candidates, because the X could not come from this individual up here. It's absolutely impossible for the X chromosome to have passed down to Liz and to Sam from this person. If they both have this substantial max, match on the X, it has to be one of these three individuals here. Can we narrow it down any further? Um, well, let's look at Betty, because Betty did the test as well. Is there a match with Betty on the X chromosome? And yes, it is. Look, a white X here and a white X over here. There is a match, and it's about 20 centimorgans, which is relatively uh, uh, robust. Now, let's look at where Betty got her X matches from. And am I progressing here as well? Ah, right. Yes, I'm recording this at the same time using two clickers, so it's a little bit difficult. Um, Betty got her X chromosome from her father, um, which is one of the siblings, one of the three siblings, and um, from her mother as well, whoever that person is, but it's not on the line that we're interested in because they're in-laws to Sam. Um, and then her father would have got his X chromosome from his mother, and then... That particular woman there would have got her X chromosomes from her father and her mother up here. So you see what's happened now. By tracing back the X chromosome of cousin Betty, we actually have narrowed it down from three individuals to two individuals. What we can say is that these two individuals here um, are the, currently the candidates for the common ancestor for Betty, Liz, and Sam. Now, the interesting thing is, according to Liz, is that these people uh, came from Ghana. These were doctors from Ghana in the 1900s. And she said it's very interesting that you match them because um, uh, they went on to have 10 children. And um, on the next slide you see uh, what Sam says. Sam says that's really fascinating because my ethnic makeup is actually 25% African. And when you look, uh, go back and look at the, um, the uh, family tree, that would actually be, be true. Here is 
this person would have got, um, would be 100% African DNA because both parents were African. Um, and then the next generation would be 20, uh, that would be 100%. The next generation would be 50%. And at Sam's level, it would be 25%. So again, the ethnicity data is compatible with all the other bits and pieces of information. So by putting all this together, you can eliminate non-contenders and you can gradually hone in on the most likely candidates for the uh, common ancestor. And that's how you actually approach a lot, of these, um, um, a lot of these adoption cases. Most of your matches will be distant relatives. Uh, my dad has 360 matches. 10% of them are relatively close, second to fifth cousins. Um, the majority of them are fourth or fifth cousins. And that's probably beyond the, 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 the reach of a lot of genealogies. But the important thing is to collaborate, to reconstruct family trees if necessary, and that means of working like a genealogist. Unfortunately, not a, not a lot of adoptees are genealogists, so this is all Greek to them. You know, you think that DNA is bad enough, genealogy is, is pretty bad as well. And it takes a lot of effort for, for adoptees to get into the mind frame of a genealogist. But for those of us here who either are adopted and are genealogists or whose parents were, were, were adopted, then it, it's a little bit different. Um, step four, working with small triangulated groups, you will find that not only do you match, that you know, if you're Sam, you don't only match Liz and Betty, you match Tom, Dick, Harry, Anthony and Cleopatra, and a whole wide range of other people as well. So it's important to work in a systematic manner. And the good people at DNA Adoption have developed a lot of very, very useful tools for working with these small triangulated groups of people who probably share a common ancestor. They have developed um, a variety of uh, things, a variety of utilities. Uh, they have a, a DNA adoption group, which currently has 2,400 members. And um, they also work very closely with DNA GetCom. They have produced a variety, they also have a Facebook group as well, which you should be encouraged to join. Uh, the ADSA tool is just one of them. And this is a very nice way of showing you your chromosomes and the various shared segments that you have with a variety of different people over on the far side. It also incorporates a matrix, which allows you to tell whether these people are also matching with each other. And if you have overlapping segments, and also a group of people who are all matches to each other, that implies a high likelihood of a common ancestor. And you should be working with this group of people to try and find the common ancestor. Once you've identified the common ancestor, then it's a question of tracing the descendants of the common ancestor down to the present day because one of those descendants will be the birth father or the birth mother. And then it's a process of testing various people among the descendants to try and narrow it down even further, narrow it down even further. It's a lot of work, it takes weeks and months of, of effort, but eventually you will get there. And these are the same techniques that we will be using as genealogists trying to break through our brick walls and finding out who our great-grandfather's parents were. Uh, they've also produced KWorks and JWorks, which are automated spreadsheets for helping you to organize your matches. And GenomeMate is also a very, very useful um, utility that you can use, again, to organize your matches into triangulated groups. So, in summary then, DNA may be a very useful additional tool. It may cut through all the red tape in a matter of weeks, but probably not. You could get lucky, you could find a half-nephew like Jenny did in the database. It may be a quick win, but probably not. It may compromise your anonymity, so if you want to remain anonymous, you're going to have to take steps to guarantee that. And before doing the DNA test, prepare yourself. Anticipate what questions you are going to be asked, and have the answers ready. The key to success in terms of the DNA is effective collaboration and working with DNA Adoption and DNA GetCom can help you identify genuine ancestors and uh, it can answer questions, but it is a long journey. It's also an exciting journey because you will have discoveries along the way. You will, typically what happens is that the adoptee will build up their ancestors first and then gradually find their, um, the, those descendants and their half-siblings that way. In Jenny's case, the hunt is on for her birth father. She said, you found my birth mother, now find my birth father. So that will be the next challenge. So um, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very, very much. If there's any questions, I'd be very, very happy to answer them. Um, DNA can answer some of the most fundamental. Who am I? 
and where do I come from? Thanks very much. Okie dokie. Has anybody got any questions? Because Joss has kindly uh, donned the microphone. Any questions? Oh, we have a question down here for the gentleman in the front row. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm more concerned with the methods of analysis okay. of the, uh, that you've done. Were these uh, people who did the analysis, did they perform analytical controls? And otherwise, one the thing, a defence, if it's a paternity case, is they question you very closely on the method of analysis. Right. You're, you've been using three uh, companies uh, there. Were there any differences between the companies the results obtained on the same sample by these companies? Otherwise, you could be in a difficult position. I know I've never done this sort of work, but I've used, um, for some years now, the, the detection of pesticides in water. And these are very, very low concentrations. Yeah, yeah. And um, the, uh, now I'd be interested whether these sorts of tests have been performed and have an, an analytical committee skilled in this sort of thing assess the results and um, give a, um, um, a certificate they, or a certification. Uh, how do they pass the standards? That, um, that should be sure. existing. Sure. Anyway, um, thank, you. thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, uh, the short answer is yes. These these tests have been verified, ratified, certified. Um, Bennett Greenspan and Max Blankfield, who are the presidents of Family Tree DNA, are just there. You can ask them and, and double check with them as well. But um, yeah, they, they have they passed all the usual certifications that you need for these kind of tests. In, because it's an American company, there's a particular certification that is required by the U.S. regulatory authorities. They pass through all of that, so they have the same kind of uh, validation and certification that all of the labs that do DNA, DNA analysis are required by law to have in the United States. Second thing is that, you know, I understand that you're working with pesticides, you're looking at very, very low concentrations of, of particular chemicals within the water. The particular test that we're looking at here, we've got 37 markers on the Y-DNA test, we have 16,500 markers on the mitochondrial DNA test, we have 750,000 markers on the um, autosomal DNA test. Now the different companies use large, when it, they all use the autosomal DNA test, they use largely the same markers. But say one of them with Ancestry has 500,000 markers, 23andMe and has maybe 600,000 markers. So there is some difference in the markers that are used. But because they are using so many of them, and because ultimately for an adoptee looking for um, a mother, you're looking at a 50% match out of 750,000 markers, the chances of it being a chance finding are 1 in 750 million. You know, so it's it's very very uh, low chance that these results are not going to be accurate, and I haven't come across a case where you know unless the lab samples get mixed up, you know that would be obviously a case where it could, or what, or contaminated. Um, if it was contaminated, um, they would know. Uh, people for some reason have swabbed their dogs, and sent the dog DNA into the lab, and the lab has come back and said there's something very wrong with your mother. <laughs> so it's it's um, it's it's been properly verified and ratified. But you know, if you have specific questions, then I I talk to uh, Bennett Greenspan. Any other questions? Are there any? Does anybody in the audience have uh, adoptions or illegitimacies in their family trees? Yes, one lady over here, another lady over here. I think a lot of family trees will have those adoptions, those illegitimacies, and um, you're go we're going to find more and more that adoptees are going to turn to DNA to actually try and solve a lot of these mysteries. So um, if you do do this test, like me, you will be contacted by adoptees saying, hi, here we're, see we're a match, we're second cousins. And you'll write back saying, well, where do you think the connection is? And they'll write back saying, I don't know, I'm adopted. Can you help? 
So it's going to be a very, very interesting time for adoptees in the next five to ten years. But listen, I'll leave it as there. It's been, uh, thank you very, very much for your kind attention for a couple of days here at Who Do You Think You Are? And I just want to thank you, the audience, for being so dedicated in coming along to all the lectures. If you do need further information, you can get it from the Genetic Genealogy Ireland website, where I've put together a whole list of resources for people who have adoptees or adoptions in their family tree. And you can get it just by Googling Genetic Genealogy Ireland, and then by clicking on the link over here, which is entitled Solving Adoption Mysteries in Your Family Tree. Thanks very, very much. Have a safe trip home. Let me just turn this off. I'm going to tell you of this coincidence. I've sat here for two days listening to these lectures.